So dust modeling framework that I've been working on is basically I'm using this kind of Lagrangian based atmosphere transport model. So when you think of Lagrangian transport model, just think of backward trajectories. That we're, that's what we're kind of doing here. And with these backward trajectories, what we're just simply trying to do is where does our air come from? And then, you know, if that air crosses over, let's say a dust emission source, we map that with um, those trajectories. And then from that, we can actually compute contributions of dust towards the area that we're modeling. So in this case, we ran backward trajectories for like Salt Lake City, and we want to figure out where did the dust come from that was measured in Salt Lake City during this event, for example. Um, we use high split stilt just because it's a lightweight trajectory model, so we can long, run this long term um, for multiple years if we really need to. And it's really, really useful for source attribution, so identifying what areas are contributing towards the dust that's being measured at some location. Um, so we have our trajectory model. We also use an atmospheric um, model that will provide a 3D model that provide the trajectory model with winds. Um, this is provided by the high resolution rapid refresh model, which is just a really high resolution um, meteorological model. And then we also have dust emissions that we also have to consider. So we use the, uh, the Fangshaw dust emission model. Um, and then I've made some updates to this code to include soil types such as Playa, which is a really big, um, a really important emitter of dust across the Great Basin and other areas across the Intermountain West. Um, this also includes a very simple kind of lake model for the Great Salt Lake, where we adjust the size of the Great Salt Lake. So if you actually work with the meteorological output, the Great Salt Lake usually is not at the correct size. So this has to be adjusted by using buoy data and then using a bathymetry data set to um, increase or decrease the size of the Great Salt Lake. Unfortunately, in our case, it's usually decreasing the size of the Great Salt Lake. And then, um, of course, you need to somehow generate dust emissions. And so um, what we do here is we use winds from the, um, the HER model, and those winds are then translated into a friction velocity. And from that friction velocity, we can see if that exceeds some type of threshold which is needed to kick up dust, which is something that uh, Mark was kind of referring to earlier. And so the dust emission, there isn't really a dust emission inventory out there that's available for people to use. And so I kind of had to um, basically throw together this framework using a lot of different data sets. And what I've done so far is I've generated a dust emission inventory um, for 2020 to 2023. So this is kind of the first of its kind. Um, the domain is just strictly the Western US. Uh, for example, we don't cover areas like Mexico just because I don't have soil data right now for Mexico, but that is something that I have a few colleagues that are kind of, you know, they're trying to push me to make that update. But nonetheless, um, we can model um, dust emissions across the entire Western US. Um, and this is all done in Python code, and it's relatively a light, lightweight kind of framework where this framework will kind of download the data that we need. Um, and then it'll kind of ingest everything together, do some calculations, and then it'll spit out an output of dust emissions every hour from 2020 to 2023. Uh, I am working on backfilling this all the way back to 2016. Granted, there will be some missing data with the HER analysis, so we'll have some missing data, but presumably we'll have dust emissions from 2016 up until the present. Okay, so I have this really cool kind of dust modeling framework. Um, can we inter or answer any really interesting scientific questions with this framework? And so um, one thing that I did is I started running stilt on a grid. So basically what I do is it kind of talked about how stilts is kind of this kind of point based model where you run these backward trajectories from a single location. And in this case, what I did decided to do is I decided to run stilt on a grid where I ran backward trajectories from two kilometer grid cells that covered all of the Wasatch front um, that you see here. And then what I did is I computed what was the um, dust contribution or the contribution of dust towards PM 2.5 across the um, this domain. And so this is for the spring of 2022. And so when you look at this map of um, PM 2.5 from dust, you notice a number of things. First off, you have this east to west gradient. Um, that's the first thing to kind of note here. Um, maybe that's not super surprising. If you're on the western side of this domain, you're closer to those dust sources, such as the Great Salt Lake, um, the West Desert, and so on. Um, and then you also have some really major dust hotspots, and this is uh, Bear River Bay and uh, Farmington Bay. And uh, those are already por portions of the Great Salt Lake that are already exposed. Um, so that's why you see these kind of really high dust concentrations located in these areas. And then um, also something that was kind of showing up, and I think this has to do with the land use category, but the copper mine is also showing up as an emitter of dust, which actually isn't probably that unrealistic. Um, and so this is showing to be an erodible area, and so therefore we're seeing dust. 
And so what I want to do is I want to see how did dust change if we change the size of the Great Salt Lake. So that's kind of what I did with this analysis. So um, this is an image of the Great Salt Lake. Um, this is a lower resolution kind of a dust emission model. So parts of Farmington Bay is kind of being just classified as um, already being totally exposed. But in many ways, it is mostly exposed, except for maybe a small little sl sliver, that's, um, which is really the Jordan River running through it. Um, so what I decided to do is remove the Great Salt Lake to see, OK, how much more dust would we get? So basically, it's just a simple kind of sensitivity um, analysis. And so this image here is showing you the current lake level, and then which is actually probably a little bit dated now. I think this is actually a little bit higher now. Um, and then this is a simulation with no lake. And so when you look at this plot, you see that, OK, dust looks a lot higher. Um, so you know it's worth noting that this dust that you see here and here, not all of this is from the Great Salt Lake, of course. We're also resolving other more distant dust sources like the, you know, the, the West Desert, um, Lake Severe, and so on. Um, but the only thing that we changed in these model simulations is the size of the Great Salt Lake. So any changes between this simulation and this simulation, you can directly attribute to the fact that um, this is due to the Great Salt Lake shrinking, or in this case, just being completely desiccated. Um, so here you see a pretty big increase of PM2.5. Um, so when we look at this as a percent change, um, I think what's, what's really striking is um, the percent change. It seems to be more kind of located on the western side of the valley. And this could be an environmental kind of justice issue here for sure, um, where, you know, you have, you know, to look, you know, you have a poor kind of population, um, a population that's well, well, um, well off in the western part of the valley. And unfortunately, it looks like that side of the valley could be more impacted by a shrinking Great Salt Lake. So um, other kind of interesting results that I thought were kind of interesting to start off with was uh, if you notice that Davis and Weber County, I thought these areas would be actually more impacted by a shrinking Great Salt Lake. Um, but in reality, this was not actually the case. And what I ultimately concluded was that well, maybe that isn't surprising because Farmington Bay and good part of Bear River Bay, it's already been exposed. So um, you actually won't see a huge change in dust for those areas um, based on this kind of subset, which is just the spring, spring of 2022. So just note that this is a relatively small sample size, but it does give you a sense of maybe how dust might change if the lake keeps shrinking. So uh, um, that was one kind of interesting result. Um, now, I kind of want to look at this from a more kind of optimistic um, standpoint, which is what if we start filling in the Great Salt Lake? Where will we um, see the biggest improvements in air quality? And so if we start raising the Great Salt Lake up to water levels that are close to maybe average um, Great, Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake water levels, which is around um, 4,200 feet um, above sea level, what you see here is a good portion of the Salt Lake Valley sees this kind of uh, reduction in dust. Um, which seems to suggest that that would have a positive, or increasing the lake levels would have a positive impact on air quality across the Salt Lake Valley. So maybe not a super surprising result, but uh, nonetheless, kind of gives you a sense of some of the improvements that you can see. Um, one thing worth noting is you don't see a big improvement in Weber in Davis County. Once again, thought this was a little bit surprising, but then when I actually looked at the um, at the uh, you know the lake in the model, a lot of Farmington Bay is still exposed, and so that's why you don't see a huge um, um, reduction in dust in those areas. Now, if you raise the lake just a few more feet, what you notice is that you start getting really big um, um, improvements in PM two point five or dust um, across this area, and that's what's happening here. Is now Farmington Bay is mostly being filled in and therefore that's really shutting off that area as a potent dust emit, uh, emission source. And so this kind of work, you know, one thought is, you know, that maybe this could be used for policymaking. Maybe it should give, it can give us an idea of maybe some of the lake levels that we need to be targeting uh, for suppressing dust across the Great Salt Lake. So that's kind of um, some of the ways I think that this, this work could be used. Um, so uh, next up for this research, what I'd like to do is um, run this analysis for other dust seasons. So just get a bigger sample size to work with. Um, I've been working very closely with Kevin and we're going to be taking some of the field measurements that um, Kevin and his students have been making and incorporating this into the model to come up with more realistic projections. And so I think that'll be really, really important. For example, we're assuming an erodibility fraction of only 10%, but I think Kevin has indicated that this might actually be closer to 20% as the crust starts breaking down. So it's also worth noting that these results could actually be a little bit underdone because of that. So, and that could have some pretty big implications as well. Um, 
And then I'm not going to steal Otto's thunder because he'll probably present this work later on. But uh, we've also been using um, this dust uh, modeling framework for seeing how um, dust impacts snow melt across um, our mountains here in Salt Lake City. And uh, what we found is that a lot of the dust that's responsible for the snow melt across this area was actually sourced from the Great Salt Lake in addition to other areas like the West Desert. So I'm not going to go into these results a, a whole lot, but just that um, it does seem like that dust from the Great Salt Lake could be accelerating snow melt by upwards of um, two weeks, or at least a large fraction of that dust is coming from the Great Salt Lake. And once again, that could be underdone just a little bit um, because of that uh, assumption that I made of just assuming a 10% erodibility fraction. Um, so yeah, so we ran model simulations where we altered the Great Salt Lake um, size. Um, and, you know, obviously decreasing the lake levels or increasing the lake levels had a no noticeable impact of dust across the Salt Lake Valley and surrounding regions. Um, and yeah, one kind of uh, thing that kind of emphasizes, we assumed a 10% erodibility fraction, which maybe that's underdone a little bit. So that could actually make the results, uh, um, those differences actually larger. Um, and then it's also worth noting that dust is not an air quality issue. This could also be accelerating snow melt um, by upwards of 17 days as um, Otto's recent paper has kind of shown that. Um, and then a kind of question that I have based on that kind of um, paper is, okay, well, we, we're seeing that we're gonna get more dust as the Great Salt Lake keeps sh um, shrinking, but um, how will this impact snow melt? You know, we saw snow melt acceler accelerating by upwards of 17 days. That's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty big increase in snow melt, but what if we, you know, keep decreasing the lake levels, how will that further accelerate snow melt? So those are maybe the kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, projections that we could do now with this modeling framework. So, um, so yeah, so that's all I have. So just, yeah.